Hi, I'm Fred Garcia. I'm Chuck Garcia. And we are adjunct associate professors at Columbia Engineering in the Professional Development and Leadership Program. We happen also to be brothers, but that's not why we're here. In addition to the work we do at Columbia Engineering, each of us also runs our own companies in the leadership space. I'm CEO of a company called Klein Leadership International. I formed it several years ago after my 25 years on Wall Street because I wanted to wake up every day in the service of others' success. What we do, we help transform leaders, mostly in the financial space because that's my background, into what we hope to become extraordinary communicators. And I am the executive director of the Logos Institute for Crisis Management and Executive Leadership. I'm in my 38th year advising leaders. And at the Logos Institute, we work with some of the biggest companies on Wall Street, in manufacturing, in engineering, in defense contracting, with universities, with sectors across the economic system, helping leaders become better leaders and helping them make smart choices when trust is on the line. We're also authors on leadership in different disciplines. And for instance, I published a book called A Climb to the Top. As a mountaineer, I wanted to be able to use the metaphor of mountain climbing and career climbing, very similar in that they have three things in common. Whether you're a leader on a mountain, you're a leader on a company, or any leadership role, you set a goal, you take one step at a time, but the most important component, you can't do it alone. So the leadership and communication tactics that I wrote about in the book and that I use in my practice every day really helps leaders and followers understand the importance of the ability to inspire, to persuade, and to provoke change. And my most recent book is The Agony of Decision, Mental Readiness, and Leadership in a Crisis. And that's how you make smart choices under stress. But my prior book was called The Power of Communication, skills to build trust, inspire loyalty, and lead effectively. And what I did in that book was to take a military manual and translate it into a civilian leadership manual to help people in all sectors become the best leaders they can be by using the discipline that we learn from that particular military manual. And one of the things I'm gonna share in this session is some of the lessons we can take from some of the best leaders, and that is from the United States Marine Corps. But before I dive into that, Chuck, give us an overview of the leadership attributes that are most important in general, and when we think about people in an engineering program going out into the world, around the world, to practice their gifts in engineering and applied science, what are the kinds of leadership traits that are most significant? Leadership is a big word, and it is certainly subject to interpretation. Whether you're in engineering, whether you're in Wall Street, whether you're leading troops up a battle, we understand and we have come to know and recognize that there are a few key pillars of leadership. Number one, irrespective of what you do, probably the most important part is the integrity, the honesty and the transparency that a leader brings and that he is able to, to help others understand and bring them into their world, recognizing the importance of their honesty. Number two, and this is where we spend a lot of our time is, in addition to having that integrity, there's a certain humility that comes with leaders where they understand and they feel and they empathize with others. And then I would say the third one, it's really rooted in communication. It's using those communication skills to be able to inspire, to persuade, but most importantly, because the world changes so fast, the ability to provoke change in a world that demands it. And what I wanna do for the next few minutes is take you through a particular leadership model, and that is a model of leadership that is used by the United States Marine Corps, which I'm honored to say has been a client of mine for the last 27 years. And as any teacher will tell you, we learn more from our students than they learn from us. And I've learned an awful lot from being around such gifted leaders as those who are leaders in the United States Marine Corps. Now, there's a lot of caricature about the military and the American military in particular, and there's a particular further caricature 
about the Marines based on movies about Marine Corps boot camp recruit training. And there's a tendency to see the military in general and Marines in particular as authoritarian and as command and control fanatics and as people who bully others and order other people around. And in my experience, that caricature isn't an accurate description of the military in general or the Marine Corps in particular. Chuck, you've also worked with the military and what has been some of your experience? Indeed, I have. And what is interesting to note is sometimes when you walk into a military environment, there's a certain expectation. And you form that expectation about what you see on television, in the movies, what you may read in the book. But the most surprising part I found, Fred, in whether it is the military or whether it is our civilian clients is they look a lot more alike than I even thought. Now, we grew up in a military environment. We grew up in West Point, New York. We grew up surrounded by soldiers. So we already had a certain image of what it was because we watched it every day. Now, later on in our lives, it is remarkable to me that when I dissect or deconstruct the characteristics of the military leaders we work with and the civilian leaders we work with, they don't look any different. And my own view is that the best leaders in civilian life and the best leaders in military life actually resemble each other. Oh, in fact, I would say you could hold a mirror up to each other and when you, when you begin to analyze what makes that leader so compelling, is there really any difference? It's not. So for today, just to set the expectations, the title of this video is Leadership, Followership, and Teamwork. What Fred and I are gonna do, we're gonna step you through the first two. Fred will take the first part of it and he'll concentrate on the leadership pillar. I'm gonna pick it up from there and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna talk about the followership uh, pillar. But what you may find surprising and what we hope is that there's gonna be a learning outcome that one, we're gonna deliver something you may not have expected, particularly when we talk about the military. And then when we get to the followership part, you're gonna find that, that we hope by the time that this is done, you'll have learned one, what makes the great leaders, but also important, what makes a great follower because followership is indeed the path to leadership and are they different? I think what we'll find today is leadership and followership are a lot more alike than people think. So let me give an overview of leadership as uh, I understand it from my work with the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I have been continuously impressed by the Marines that I've met for their integrity, for their ability to inspire, for their technical competence. But when people study leadership, one of the things they find is that Marines are in some ways fanatical about leadership. Uh, and the application of the leadership discipline that they bring to their work has direct application into the civilian world as Chuck has observed. And I'd like to point out the CEO of Federal Express, Fred Smith, has observed that the Marines are arguably the best leadership training organization one could possibly imagine. And he notes that those leadership skills have a very measurable impact in a civilian company's bottom line. One of the things I have found when I have worked with Marines is their view of leadership is not the caricature we see from the movies. So for example, just under 100 years ago, the then Commandant of the Marine Corps, John Lejeune, described the Marine Corps approach to leadership and almost 100 years later, it continues to be this approach. And he described leadership as the sum of those qualities of intellect, of human understanding, and of moral character that enables a person to inspire and to control a group of people successfully. But remarkably, as he continued his description of leadership, he pointed out that the relationship between the leader and the led should in no sense be that of a superior to an inferior or that of a master to a servant, but rather he likens it more to the relationship between a teacher and a student. And I'd like to point out as a teacher, Chuck and I are both teachers and children of teachers, is that at any given time, a teacher is also a student. 
And we teachers learn from our students, and we teachers continue in scholarship and in other forms to be students ourselves. Well, interesting. It sounds like you're forming a parallel teacher, student, mentor, mentee, leadership, followership. Are they really that different? Actually, one, one of the reasons that I love studying the Marines is at any given moment, any given Marine is simultaneously a leader and a follower. Well, even in the civilian world, one thing that we know, whether you're in a Marine or whether you're in a company, everybody has a boss. But what we know is the boss, while he may be looked at as a leader, what did he do before he was a leader? He was a follower. And what characteristics did he had to exhibit in order to become that? Those of a leader. What we're going to find later on in this video is we're going to find, we're going to flip-flop it. Mm -hmm. That the follower becomes the leader, but does the leader ever stop being the follower? Maybe they're the same thing. And maybe that's the way that we're talking about this. And, and every boss has a boss. Indeed. Even the CEO has a board of directors. And clients. And, and clients and business partners and right. others. And one of the things we find is the traits that make a good follower are also traits that make a good leader. Right. And at any given moment, any individual has to be able to pivot right. from being a leader and a follower. And that pivot has to be natural and organic. Good point. It can't be faked. And what I find many of the leaders that I train, and the focus is very much on communication, but when you focus on communication, you're basically focusing on everything because what you're trying to do is to move others to a cause. And what I find about the really good leaders is they exhibit the humility that allows them to put themselves in the shoes of, let's just put it in the context of a follower, although they never look at it that way. Everybody's a leader, and to a, to a leader, what they're trying to do is develop others to bring up their own leadership capabilities no matter what it's called. But many people join a company in the Marines if they come in as a private or in their, 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 they come in at the ground floor of a company. Their mindset is that is a followership. What I hope we're going to be able to do is to help with that mindset that that follower becomes the leader. And in order to do that, you have to adopt the mindset of these leadership characteristics that we're going to talk about. When we look, for example, at the leadership principles that the Marine Corps instills in Marines, uh, you can see that there's very little difference between what we would expect a military leader and a civilian leader to exhibit, and also very little difference between the skills of following a leader and leading followers. So the first is to know yourself and to seek self-improvement, to have a commitment to get continuously better and better. Now, that's not unique to people in uniform. That is also the way to think about it when you are in a service business, when you are in a manufacturing business. It's critically important to have self-awareness of your own strengths and the ability to recognize where you need to build additional strengths and overcome some challenges. Indeed, and, and when I, the, the great Steve Jobs had said, knowing yourself, it's simple, but it's not easy. And one of the things we do in the PDL program, we actually teach emotional intelligence. If for no other reason, part of being a good leader is understanding self-awareness, social awareness, understanding in time and space how others revolve around you so that you may be in a position, and you're often called on, to be the leader, but also to be the follower. And to your point, Fred, to be able to pivot and know the difference between the two. And I know we're going to see in a little bit later on in one of the videos where it's flip-flopped. The leader becomes the follower because the follower says something to the leader which exhibited leadership qualities. And that's really cool. And, and wherever one is in the chain of command, the best leaders hold themselves accountable to those who are technically followers. And when, they, when the follower pivots to hold the leader accountable, that follower is essentially becoming a leader and that leader is essentially becoming a And I think one thing we can agree on, it takes a great deal of humility to put yourself in that position. Those are the leaders that we admire. And, and it's, it's in some ways counterintuitive to think of senior military officers or CEOs or archbishops or other people in positions of authority as exhibiting humility, but the best do. The second leadership principle that the Marines instill, but that we can see applicable in any discipline, including engineering, and that is there's an expectation that leaders be technically proficient, that they know how to do what they're called upon to do. The next is they develop a sense of responsibility 
among the teams that they work with, and in particular among those who are supposed to be followers, and that sense of responsibility, which so sometimes I call accountability, is a critically important element not only of effectiveness but also of trust. Yeah, and I think irrespective of the profession, particularly the engineering, we certainly saw in finance and pharmaceuticals or whatever it is, we know that in order to build credibility, while there may be so many other things you have to think about being a leader, in order to build that credibility, there has to be some threshold of technical competence. You don't have to be perfect, you don't have to know everything, but you have to be really good at what you do if you expect to move up to the other leadership attributes, but I would see that in our world as, as not negotiable. Got to be good at that. The next is to make sound decisions in a timely way, to set the example for others on your team, to know your team and to look out for their welfare. And that's critically important that the leader in some ways has a protective function and that is to make sure that their team members are thriving, to make sure that they have the resources they need to do their jobs well, and to check in with them and have a clear sense of whether they're getting what they need to get and whether they're developing as they need to develop. Yeah, I think a big part of that is the environment you set. I see that because in many people that we train and many people that we teach, there is often a fear, a fear of making mistakes, a fear of failure. And oftentimes, if they don't confront those fears, those fears become their limits. What we know about in the Marines for war fighters, if a mistake is made, sometimes lives are at stake. But in our case, particularly for the engineers, maybe a life isn't, life isn't at stake, however, What's at stake are the decisions necessary to move the company in the direction that you want, but often what you're talking about is creating an environment that would allow them to be imperfect, to make mistakes, to learn from them, hopefully never repeating the same mistake. But what I love about the Marines, it seems they create that environment where don't be afraid to make mistakes, be afraid of not learning from those mistakes. It's better to ask for forgiveness than to need to ask for permission. No question. And and. One of the things we find is taking that initiative for the good of your team is almost always a good idea. Right. And, and the more the leader can be on the lookout to make the team as effective as possible, the more likely that team is to function well and therefore the organization to function well, whether it's a company or a laboratory or a military unit. Well, that comes with the environment where you allow them the freedom to make those decisions. And if in fact there were mistakes, we'll adjust. Once you adjust those mistakes, then you move on. And, and that gets to the next attributes of uh, the leadership that the Marines instill in their leaders. The one is to keep your team informed, and the second is to seek responsibility and to take responsibility for your own actions, including when you mess up. And it's okay to mess up, but it's not okay to mess up and cover it up. That you need to mess up and declare it and account for it and say what you're going to do about it and what you learned from it and move on. And the best leaders create environments where people can safely do that, where they don't feel that they are personally vulnerable for acknowledging that they made a mistake or that something didn't go as they had hoped or that they frankly dropped the ball on something. The question is not, how did you do that? The question is, well, what are you going to do about it? And how are we going to respond based on that? Well, one of the things I loved in, 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 in the message of your book, The Power of Communication, you talked about the importance of the alignment of words and actions. It's okay to make a mistake. It's not okay to misalign the words and the actions. And that sounds like what you're describing. That, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, the next leadership principles are to make sure that the assigned tasks are well understood and are well, uh, uh, well supervised and ultimately accomplished. Uh, the next duty of a good leader is to train the team and to make sure that that team functions well. And then finally, to employ one's command according to that group's own capabilities. Don't ask the team to do that which they're not capable of doing. You can help them strive to do more and better, but that's not the same as putting them in a situation where they're certain to fail. And the leaders are on the lookout to constantly challenge their team, but not to put them in a situation where they're likely to fail. When the Marines have been effectively trained and when they have become good leaders, they tend to exhibit a number of traits and we don't need to dwell on them, but we can see that these are not specific to any particular element of being in uniform, that the traits that the best leaders exhibit include judgment and justice and dependability and initiative and decisiveness and tact 
which is a critically important one, especially for people in uniform, but also for people who wear suits or who wear lab coats. Endurance and bearing and unselfishness and courage and knowledge and loyalty. But I note the last one on that list is really interesting, and that's enthusiasm. I love that one. Enthusiasm is having a winning spirit. And whether you're just starting out in an organization, or you're a mid-level manager, or you're at the top of the organization, enthusiasm is contagious. Well, I think that one thing that we have learned is nothing great ever gets done without it. That enthusiasm is both infectious, but it also is a facilitator of other very positive things. Oh, no question. I think it opens up so many doors because it opens up and allows people space into your world where you're enthusiastic about something. I'm even enthusiastic about making mistakes because the only mistake is being too afraid to make one. So I wrap my arms around it and I embrace it because that's the learning occurs in the discomfort. And that comes with the enthusiasm to allow them to room to screw it up. One of the things that I have found that has been a surprise because of the caricature of people in uniform in general and of Marines in particular is the degree to which Marines and any good leader needs to take care of the people on the team. Now, unrelated to the military, uh, I have a friend who's a really gifted leadership coach uh, who's technically trained as an anthropologist and used to be an anthropologist for the U.S. State Department and then became an anthropologist for the big advertising agencies. But he has studied leadership very carefully. And he says, when we look at the best leaders, the people whom they lead tend to describe the leader in three different ways. Uh, the first is, the leader is like me. We have something meaningful in common. There is a connection, there is a familiarity, there is a shared experience or a shared sense of purpose that I and the leader have something meaningful in common. The next is the leader likes me. That I know that the leader is looking out for me and my team. I know that the leader will cover our backs. I know that the leader won't turn on us and throw us under the bus if things go wrong. And the final thing is, the leader is more than I am. I'm glad that that person is the leader because she or he has capacities beyond what I currently have, and I'm really glad that this person is in charge. These three elements, the identification that we have something meaningful in common, that sense of protection and affection, and the sense of that person is further along in capacity than I am, not a permanent condition, but a real position at the time, those things together are the kinds of reactions that people who are led by good leaders typically have. That's interesting. That parallels in one of the classes we had, it was called executive presence. And what we talked about is that when one makes a first impression, they have 250 milliseconds to make it. That's faster than the blink of an eye. But what the research has shown is the person who is who is forming an impression, informs the impression on three dimensions, likability, competence, and trustworthiness. That's right at the first impression. What you're describing is simply that same first impression, and now how do you sustain it and make it lasting? I don't see any difference between that first impression where that's what you search for, and indeed what you identify and build a rapport as a leader. And that's why authenticity is so important, because if you don't get it right in the first moments, you're not gonna be able to sustain it in the later moments. For sure. With that, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at a veteran Marine and his description of the best led groups that he has ever seen. Uh, we're gonna look at somebody who is identifiable right now because he has a really important job and that he is currently the Secretary of Defense of the United States, that's uh, James Mattis. Uh, but before he was Secretary of State, he had retired for a couple of years uh, after being a Marine for 40 years. Uh, he had been a Marine for 40 years. He finished as the head of Central Command, which is that part of the world that governs both the Middle East and Afghanistan and South Asia. And he was known as a Marine's Marine. One of the things that he was known for is that he is an avid reader and encourages all Marines to read voraciously. And he says, the more I read, 
the better a leader I am because I can learn from other people's experience without suffering the trauma of their failures and being able to ride on their successes. But before he was Secretary of Defense, he was having a Q&A with, with current serving Marines, and he was asked a question about the best leadership traits. I thought it'd be interesting to watch a little bit of that Q&A. Uh, here's General James Mattis when he was a retired Marine before he became the Secretary of Defense. Jonathan Herrera wants to know, what is the one leadership lesson you learned as a general grade officer that you would wish to have known your whole career? You know, you learn all the way through, uh, Jonathan, at each rank, you're learning more. And if there was one lesson that came more and more into focus over the years. It was one I learned by watching similar sized units. Like for example, I watched dozens of platoons go through certain ranges, or I saw companies, dozens of companies in fights. I always wondered what made one unit better than another. They were all well trained. They all came through the boot camp, all of them. All of them had been recruited from America, and they were quality young men. So what made them different? It was the junior leadership, the junior NCOs, the junior officers whose coaching, whose animating spirits brought out the best in their troops, who had admired leadership. We all know that earning the trust and respect of your subordinates is critical. You, you simply have to earn that trust. You have to earn that respect. You have to earn that every day because when it's all over and done with, you're not going to win any fights as a leader. Your troops are going to win those fights. But there was another word I learned to prioritize as I evaluated units, and that word was affection. It's not popularity with all the favoritism that comes with trying to be a popular person as a leader. That's a, a road to failure. But affection that you create in a unit, an affection so strong that the troops will stick by one another, they'll carry out the mission even in peril. And I bring this one up because I believe that that kind of affection brings out self-discipline, where people don't want to let down the unit. And I think that if there is one lesson I learned along the way that the more you can build that kind of affection in a unit, when the going gets tough, when people are getting shot down around you, it'll pull together, it'll pull through. And it'll be a lot smoother organization, it'll move more rapidly against the enemy, more fluidly against the enemy, and it will, generally speaking, have fewer disciplinary problems in garrison, whether it be DUIs, sexual harassment, or all that, that stuff that you see some jerks do, and on the other hand, when you're in combat, you'll find that they really play hell with the enemy because of what they sense about each other and the conviction they have to supporting one another, their commitment to one another. So, so Chuck, there's, there's two things I want to call out from General Mattis's observation. The first is he essentially did a, a, a sort of informal social science experiment, and that is he looked at similarly situated organizations, and he saw some were better performing than others, and he looked for what is the difference and I think it's quite notable that he concluded that the difference is the animating spirit of the junior leaders. Mm -hmm. the, in, in, in a military unit, the people who are about 21 years old. Uh, the 21-year-old, the 24-year-old, not the 45-year-old senior officers, All right. but, but the juniors who are technically followers but are, in this really important sense, the most critical leaders. Well, what we're going to talk about in the next section on the followership is exactly that, going to taking the leader at whatever age and coming down and building the rapport to the follower to understand and to empathize what is it this follower is doing and how can I, as the leader, help? And that's what he's doing here. I gotta say though, one thing that was shocking and when I saw that, I never would have thought or associated a four-star general with the word affection. Because when we talk about the Marines, they're not sitting around giving each other hugs. You think of barking orders. Yet the message here is a very different one, affection. And that just kept going through my head. And I said, my goodness, is that what this is? Well, in, in, in the civilian world, and it's not necessarily giving hugs, but I love the message that you could affect 
showing affection to someone that's otherwise about to shoot somebody, there's something really cool in that. And, and what, what I found really endearing about the Marines is that this affection takes really tangible form. So for example, some years ago, I was at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, a giant military base, giant Marine Corps base. And it was summertime and it was hot and it was humid because it's built on a swamp. And the Marines were doing a capabilities exercise, essentially a war game for visiting dignitaries from Congress. And we saw Marines going from a ship and landing on a beach. We saw Marines on helicopters rescue down pilots. We saw Marines do a hostage rescue in a simulated embassy. And the Marines were in full battle gear and, and they were hot and they were sweaty. And then at some point, everyone broke for lunch and there was a field kitchen set up. And the Marines were going into the field kitchen and there were a couple of officers who were the sponsors of this day. And I went to chat with them and they asked if I was gonna get online for some food. And I asked them, are you getting online? And they said, oh, not yet. And I asked, aren't you hungry? And they said, oh no, officers eat last. And I said, say that again. Yes. And he says, well, we officers aren't going to have any food until every one of the other Marines has already had as much as they want. And we defer to them. And that's a really tangible form of affection. It's a tangible form of empathy. And that is, I may be superior in pay grade and in the chain of command, but I will defer to you before I have that particular benefit. Now in civilian leadership, that's a very powerful concept, but I have to say, I've worked on Wall Street for a long time. That is not a common trait. I've worked with giant corporations. That is not a common trait, but imagine if it were, if we would defer our own comfort, our own immediate gratification to our team first before us. Yeah, you know, Simon Sinek, you know, uh, we all, many of us read his book, Start With Why, but he followed that up with Leader, the Leader Eats Last. And what we know in our civilian world is the really good ones, they eat dinner. In fact, in Disney, there was a case study where they got rid of the executive cafeteria and said, this is crazy. We're not gonna put two levels. And all of a sudden, they started to eat with the troops, so to speak. And it really created a culture and it fostered a culture, not so much of being egalitarian, that wasn't the point. The point was to bring the leaders and the followers together over a meal where a lot of the intimacy and the affection occur and a lot of the great ideas. And they found it was a hotbed of ideas because they were able to exchange leader to follower, follower to leader in a way that just took a lot of the inhibitions away. And, and what it does is it breaks down the barriers of accountability. Right. And, and it says we senior people are accountable to you junior people even as you junior people are accountable to us and we are each accountable to each other. And we are all each other's teachers. And, and that leads to, to what I think is going to be my last explicit lesson on leadership and that has to do with something that happened in on Christmas Eve uh, of 2017 as we're taping this in January of 2018 it was happened just about a month ago uh, and that is something that happened with the Commandant of the Marine Corps the current head of the Marines of all Marines uh, around the world uh, and his name is General Robert Neller and he is a four-star Marine and he's a combat veteran and he's a tough guy and he's a big guy and he's a muscular guy. And on Christmas Eve in 2017, he was in Afghanistan. <clears throat> he was in Helmand province, which is a, a pretty tough part of Afghanistan. And there are a bunch of Marines, there are 700 Marines uh, in this particular base in Helmand province. And he was wishing them a Merry Christmas, a happy holiday uh, during a, a period of, of really tough duty. And while there, he took the opportunity to tell a story about himself, about one of his own potential leadership failings. And that is something that happened some years earlier in 2005, when he was the commanding officer of the Marines in the city of Fallujah in Iraq. Now in late 2004, there had been a battle in Fallujah. It was the bloodiest battle in the war in Iraq and even bloodier than any war in Afghanistan. It's one of the bloodiest battles in uh, American military history since Vietnam. And he was the commander in the aftermath of that. And it was Christmas uh, morning and he woke up in his command headquarters uh, and he discovered something that had happened overnight and he lost it. Uh, and let's look at what he told the Marines uh, on Christmas Eve in Afghanistan about his own leadership when he was the leader of Marines uh, in Iraq in 2005. 
Christmas. So here's my Christmas story for you. <laughs> so it's 2006, it's a rack, kind of feeling like, like the task force guys, you know, you're tired. You're tired to the point where you're like kind of cranky. You know, you don't want to be here, it's Christmas. You don't want to be home and you're almost, you can see the end. It's like, it's like right, you can like touch it, but it's, you can't grab it. So it was, it was a Camp Fallujah, it was cold, it was wet, rainy, and I don't know. I just got up in the morning and I just, one of those days, you know, I mean, I mean, I know everybody here gets up every morning and goes, Oh, Ron, I'm a freak, yeah, yeah, like him. <laughs> Not really. So I walked in the office and they had, overnight they put up all the Christmas stuff and Frosty the Snowman and, you know, Santa Claus and Rudolph and little trees and lights and I'm like who did this why are you doing this do you real I I don't want to be here for Christmas and this is reminding me that I'm here take it all down so Chuck the general in front of a staff has a mini tantrum and he says I don't want to be reminded that I'm here at Christmas take this stuff down what do you think the Marines do? No, they followed the order. They took it down? In fact... <laughs> Tell um, me they didn't. He <laughs> describes what happens next. Huh. And this uh, female sergeant, first name escapes me, maybe five foot one, a buck ten, stands up and goes, General, you need to knock the shit off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to listen to any of your whiny <laughs> We're here. It's Christmas, we're your family, you're not gonna be home, so suck it up, sir. What, what I have found remarkable about that is here is a sergeant way down the chain of command from the commanding general, and she witnesses the leader behaving in a way that is contrary to the leadership traits. The leader is acting selfishly, the leader is acting in a way of being sorry for himself, and he issues an impulsive command which he ought to know better than to do. But she holds him accountable and she pushes back and says, General, I need you to stop that. You are whining. You are here. You're not going to be home. Implied, we're all here too. If, however sorry you feel for yourself, you're still a general. We are here and we're out in the mud and we're doing the fighting. And I'm not going to take that anymore. Suck it up. But then she said, sir. With respect. So she was speaking reflect respectfully, but she was holding him accountable. Yeah, interesting. This is where we, the lines, are they blurred or... Our leadership and followership simply interchangeable and at times the leader in this case became in a sense we think of as maybe the follower and the follower exhibited the leadership characteristics to hold that leader accountable so he was in the process of being corrected by a subordinate right cool and 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 what is remarkable to me is the humility that that leader needs to exhibit in order to allow that correction to take place and by the way it's taking place in public it's not taking place in a private office, it's taking place out in front of other Marines. Well, let's hear how General Neller replied to the sergeant. And I kind of stood there, didn't quite know what to say, <laughs> looked at my boots, and I said, raised my head, I said, yes, ma'am, you are correct. I am sorry. This is my family. So I'd like us to observe that on being corrected, his first response was not to lash out. Mm -hmm. His first response was to stop. He put his head down, he looked at his boots, he was thinking, and then he put his head up and he addressed the sergeant as ma'am. You don't address a sergeant as ma'am, you address a sergeant as sergeant. You address a superior officer as ma'am. But he was showing her respect. Wow. 
he, he didn't say, Sergeant, you are correct. He said, yes, ma'am, you are correct. Sometimes the leader steps out of bounds of the protocol in order to give that respect. And in this case, the humility came through where he was able to honor that respect. He, he honored that. Wow, and so he said, you are correct. I am sorry. And then he said what he's going to do about it. I'm here. This is my family. I will have the best Christmas I can. He allowed himself to be corrected. What is remarkable to me is he created an environment in which a subordinate felt empowered to hold him accountable. Oh, that's great. And, and the best leaders exhibit that humility, as, as you said before. It's okay to mess up. Yeah. It's not okay to avoid accountability for messing up. Correct. And, and here, the general messed up. And bosses mess up all the time. He is human. And it is important as a leadership trait to recognize that there are times when someone who's technically a follower has to step into the leadership role and correct the leader who now becomes a follower. So here's a question. Fred, I know we're both fans of bookstores to the extent there are any left. And I, what I naturally do when I go into a bookstore, can't help it, I just gravitate to the leadership section because I just want to see what else can I learn from there. And when you walk into a bookstore, at least this is my local Barnes & Noble, what you find is a whole bunch of books and they all exhibit the word leadership. And if I were to ask many of our students, what are your ambitions or what are you listing on your resume? it's likely you are, the word leadership appears maybe more than once. But the word followership may not. But here's the question for you. Whether you are in a bookstore or whether you go online, I wanted to put this to a test. How many books are there if you go into Amazon and you put in the word leadership? Take a guess. How many books are there on leadership? I would guess it's a gazillion. <laughs> it's a lot. Well, it's not a gazillion, but it's 126,000. That's a lot of books. I don't know about you. I can only read one book at a time. I'm not sure I'll ever get to that number. God willing, we'll try. But here is the important part, and here's where we heighten the contrast. Type in the word followership. How many for followership do you think there are? Um, I would have to say there have to be far fewer. <laughs> there are indeed far fewer. In fact, the number is 237. So let's contrast 126,000 on leadership. 237 on followership. Have you seen followership on a resume ever? I've never seen followership You never on a do, but what we're beginning to assert in which we're going to slip into the civilian world, are they really different and why is it? Well, I, I checked in and, and one conclusion that I was able to make myself is, while well, leadership has been studied extensively because there are 126,000 books that tell you so, Followership, or at least the literature on followership, has been largely ignored. Would you say that's a fair conclusion? I think that's completely fair. So what I did, I checked in with some of the other leadership theorists. And I was like, what are they saying in many of their books I've read? And this is one of them named by Brian Tracy. And it struck me because he said, leaders think and talk about the solutions. Okay, that's great. But he also said something that he said, followers think and talk about the problems. And I don't think he was framing this in the most technical sense of leadership and followership, I think he was just making a distinction about mindset. That sometimes you have someone that has the mindset of complaining and whining, they tend not to be associated with leadership. Would you see that? And, and we even saw that in the case of the, the Marine Corps Commandant who had stopped being a leader when he began to whine and complain. That's right. And the sergeant... Talk about the problem. And, and then the sergeant came in and said, you got to stop that. Right. But, but if we look at, at some others, and this is Warren, Professor Warren Bennis, at, he's at uh, USC, and he wrote a lot of great books on leadership. One of them that I really admired was Unbecoming a Leader. But what I liked about the book is he made the distinction, and I quote, well, what he said in the book is, I am reminded how hollow the label of leadership is and how heroic followership can be. Just that statement got my attention. Her heroic, heroic nature of followers. Right, indeed. And what he came to define then is what is it this followership? So Fred, can you just 
Take a look and see that. An important role to carry out the responsibilities necessary to keep organizations functioning properly. Now, I would say you could probably integrate that with leaders, followers, whatever it takes. And here, what he mentioned is three characteristics. Go ahead with number one. It just, just, just what, well, what would they need to do? Capable of self-management means that they are self-aware. Right and that they are self-motivated, yeah. that they don't need someone with a clipboard hovering over them to make sure that a task gets completed. Correct. Uh, the second? Strive to execute objectives to high professional standards. It's good, you wanna bring that high standard every day. But, but what I find interesting is it's not to execute tasks, but it's to execute objectives. objectives. It's not task which, mastery, which, it's which, not leadership. Which is the alignment of tasks to the goal that the task is intended to serve. Correct. And then lastly, whether it's a leader, follower, or just the characteristics of a good human being, set a good example while serving the needs of the organization. And this is followership. This is followership. According to Bennis? According to Bennis. But let's put that now into the context of the working world, or many of you may. And I'd like to introduce the next guest. His name is Tony Shai. There's multiple pronunciations to his name, but you may know him as the CEO of a company called Zappos, which is an Amazon dot company. In his book, what I found fascinating is people asked him, could you please compare and contrast leaders to followers? And here's what he said. Fred, why don't you take the leadership? These are the three characteristics <laughs> that Tony said defines good leaders. Number one. Respect for authority. Number two. Positive attitude. And number three. Integrity. All right, so now let's go to the followers. We know what the three pillars are for leadership as defined by Zappos. Let's compare and contrast that and examine the tremendous differences between one and two. So Fred, for followership, what did Tony say was number one? Respect for authority. I think we've seen this movie before. Number two. Positive attitude. And number three. Integrity. So what's the difference? The question is, is there a difference? Is there a difference? So I'll, let's, let's examine a bit more. And what he said is the one thing, while we speak with purpose, he talked about the importance of leaders and followers of listening with intent. That that no matter what they do, that that is what often separates the really good leaders and followers from the not so good leaders and followers. I would just like to hear the opinion of another leadership guru who wrote a, wrote a book. His name is Mike McKinney, and he wrote a book called All or Nothing. And what he said in the book, which got my attention, he said, followers, followership, like leadership, is a role, not a destination. It's something that you play. Would you agree with that? I, I would, and sometimes you're playing the role of leader, and sometimes you're playing the role of follower, and, and simultaneous, you could be both. And he talked about the importance of, of, of the interchange. So I'd like to introduce our last guest for today. This gentleman, he has a certain distinction before we introduce him, that he was? He was the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2010. In 2010. And if you look at this individual, you may recognize him. His name is Todd Peterson. And he is the CEO and the founder of a company called Vivint, located in Salt Lake City, Utah. What is interesting about this leader, before we get to him, is first, let's understand what his company does. If you drive around Utah or anywhere in the United States and you look into a neighborhood, you may see a sign that says, protected by Vivint. Well, that sign is an expression of what this company does for a living and that what they create or what they manufacture are, are devices for smart homes. He's also one of the largest in, uh, manufacturers and installers of solar panels. But where you may recognize him is something different. When, Fred, he was talking to his father, and he asked his father for some advice. He said, Dad, I'm thinking about starting my own company. Is there any advice you would give me? And his father gave him three pieces of advice that he never forgot. Number one, provide the best customer service possible. Number two, treat your employees like gold. And number three, here was the interesting one. The rest will take care of itself. He said, if we just get those two right, so maybe. Treat your customers well, treat your employees well, everything else takes everything care of itself. Everything will take care of itself and don't worry. He started his business in a trailer. It was just him. He was an army of one. Several years later, the company valuation when Blackstone, a private equity firm, purchased them was at $2 billion. 
very proud of his accomplishment. But here's where you may recognize this gentleman. He stood in an audience with his employees, and what he heard or observed were what he called the employee voices. He wanted to hear from them how they felt. And he looked at that opportunity, is it a bird? He looked at it, is this a burden, or is this an opportunity for the feedback that he was receiving? And what he thought about at the time is that leadership, that's only half the story. There was so much more that he was learning from the interactions with his employees. And he asks, between leadership and followership, is there a difference? But the important question is how best to examine whether there is a difference. And he wanted to examine it not for any kind of intellectual pursuit. He really wanted to understand, having grown the company to 7,000 people, how can I help all of my employees succeed and live up to the principles of the advice that my father and, gave me? And I would imagine that if he can't treat his 7,000 employees as well as he needs to, they will not do customer service very well. Well, he put that to a test. And so he became a cast member for a week or for one show on a television show called Undercover Boss. And for those who are watching this that may not be familiar with this show, it's a great concept where a CEO, a founder, or somebody runs a company, goes in disguise, becomes physically somebody that the employees probably, and most of the time, don't recognize, and comes into the company taking a job that is, that is more conventional of the followership, and he takes a job in what is an entry-level position in the company. And Fred, if you could, this is what he said as part of the motivation to come on to Undercover Boss. He said, we now employ 7,000 people, and I don't have daily interaction with many of them. Going on the show provided an opportunity to get to know some of my employees better, but also to learn more about the day-to-day -day processes that keep the company going. And what he said, he looked at what could I learn from this, and he said there's a couple learning outcomes. Num one, I wanted to understand the employee perceptions of the company, so if there's any adjustments I need to make, I'll know what they are and I'll hear it firsthand. Second, I wanted to have a temperature check to feel the morale and the spirit of the workforce because I felt like the higher up we, I got in the company, the more that I was not feeling that, and I felt it was important to get back to that. And then third, he wanted to learn about himself. How important, you talked about self-awareness, Fred, how important is it that that leader, whether it's this exercise or others, that they know themselves? It, knowing yourself is critical. That's actually the first leadership principle the Marines teach. Yeah, that's a really good one. So here, if you take a look at this, you will see that on the left-hand side in the upper left-hand quadrant, this is him as employees recognize him, and that is a wig that was glued to his head for an entire week. And also week. glued to his chin. And glued to his chin. <laughs> and in, in looking at what he did, the first job that he did when he came into this, he worked in the call center. And if you look at him, the purpose of starting in the call center, of taking all the customer service calls, is a good leader puts themselves in the shoes of the followers. Part of this was a discovery. It was self-discovery and it was employee discovery. He wanted to be able to merge it to and could this company come out better after the show than it was before. So here's what he said. And he said, the experience on Undercover Boss reminded me how essential Vivid's employees are to the success of the company. And Peterson then, one of the questions Fred that he posed was, does being a follower have a negative connotation? And he wondered about that because he wanted to see what was the morale of those that were considered their followers. And he wanted to see, do we have that right? And what he said, or, and he said, or another question, is being an effective follower the path to being a good leader? Does a good follower make a better leader? As he continued to, to, to reflect on the show, here were his conclusions. It was really cool to see it. And this is what he said. He said, Fred, fire away. Followers as powerfully driven to follow as leaders are powerfully driven to lead. Because he found that the best followers exhibited the kinds of characteristics that helped him to become an effective leader and vice versa, just like what you showed in the Marines. And then I want to bring in one more um, and talk about the theories of followership. And this is a gentleman named Dr. Robert Kelly who's on faculty at Carnegie Mellon. And he wrote a book 
that I enjoyed immensely called The Power of Followership, one of the 237 that you can find when you sort. And I first learned about him from an article in the Harvard Business Review, and this is in the title, In Praise of Followers, but this is what he said. Fred, could you share what it is I highlighted? In Praise of Followers, organizations stand or fall partly on the basis of how well their leaders lead, but partly also on the basis of how well their followers follow. He continued on. One last thing that he concluded in the article was? So follow sh followership dominates our lives and organizations, but not our thinking, because our preoccupation with leadership keeps us from considering the nature and the importance of the follower. So when we bring it all together, the followership model, what he talked about, what he drew was, was a model of followership. And in this model, there were four quadrants, even though there was one in between. And if you follow the model, really the question that I'm asking you is, what kind of follower do you aspire to be? Because what the CEO of Vivint found, he learned a lot about recognizing what kind of followers people could be. He first had to determine what characteristics do people exhibit. So there were four. And Fred, can you make the distinction on this graph between independent thinking and dependent, uncritical thinking? So independent thinking are people who figure things out for themselves, and dependent, uncritical thinking is people who simply take what they're given and don't take it any further. Right, so he put on, on his theory independent critical thinking at the top, dependent uncritical thinking at the bottom, and passive and active characteristics. Can you just explain that just a second about people's behavior? So the passive are folks who, who do what they're told and nothing more, and the active are people who constantly strive to do more better. So what he did is he put all of them together and he created in there four different types of, of followers. The first thing I'm going to highlight is called the sheep. Now when you hear the word sheep, it has a certain connotation. And we'll expand on those in just a second. The second part is we look at passive and independent is what he refers to as an alienated follower. The third, which is the quadrant that many people seek the, 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 this is the benchmark of followership is they are both independent and critical and they are active in how they behave. They don't sit around waiting for instructions. To your point, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Right. And then the last point, this is an interesting one, it's called a yes person. You describe that a bit? Oh, the yes person is, is someone who essentially ingratiates himself or herself to the boss right. without making a meaningful contribution and is essentially there to validate the ego of the boss right. rather than to help the organization move forward. That's a good point. Let's just validate the ego of the boss and it's okay. Now when you put all of them together, there is one that's right in the middle that may exhibit characteristics of all of them because these are called the survivors. They are a little bit of all of whatever it takes to just stay alive in the organization. And, and, and is it your sense that they are nimble going from little parts of each quadrant as necessary or that they simultaneously inhabit some element of all four? Yeah, well, it, 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 yes to both. Okay. And it depends on how you choose to survive. Right. You may have one and then you find you got to do the other. They tend to be pretty nimble and they figure out, they lay back a bit. Sometimes they're passive, sometimes they're active. You just sometimes critical thinking helps them, sometimes critical thinking impedes them. Right. Okay. But they don't fall into their characteristically into any one of those four. So they're not predictably tomorrow going to be any one of these just because they were that today. Good point. Because if we look at the first one, this is a predictable one. So Fred, tell us about the sheep. The, the sheep need lots of external motivation and constant supervision from the leader. This is essentially the, the guy with a clipboard and a checklist making yeah. sure that they're following their tasks. Yeah, they are taskmasters, which is not necessarily leadership. Here's an interesting one because the second one is potentially destructive, and these are called the alienated. Let, 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 let's, let's define them a bit. So let's talk about that, Fred. I'm going to lay out three different things. Let's share. They have a negative view of themselves as rightful leaders, and the consequence of that is that they inhibit progress at every turn. If, if there is anything that drives not just leaders, followers, anybody crazy, are people, even though they may disagree, if they seek to inhibit or to get in the way and, and, and to be barriers, that's just a lot of maintenance that nobody wants to deal with because there's just sometimes too much so, to do. So, for example, when we looked at the Marine Corps leadership 
principles, the last one, which is a very important one that you got very excited about, is called enthusiasm. Yeah. And, and if I interpret this idea that they have a negative view of themselves and they inhibit progress, they have had that enthusiasm either wrung out of them or they didn't have it to begin with, but because they're alienated, I would imagine that they were at some point not alienated. Yeah. And they were critical thinkers and they may have even been in the active place, but either through conditioning or something else, they moved over to the left quadrant and became passive even though they're critical thinkers, and I imagine that would be a very frustrating place to be. Yeah, usually in the alienated, there is a sense of conversion that some events or some behaviors occur that cause that alienation that often happens where somebody is switching characteristically, hey, this is not the guy I hired, and when you further examine why, you begin to recognize, but sometimes that enthusiasm, that power of the enthusiasm is the complete opposite, and they use it, that. It becomes a negative force that right. drains enthusiasm from others. And what we know is that negative force is generally more powerful than an equal force on the positive side. Yep. So the alienated ones are tough. And then there's also another one, and these are called the pragmatist. They will not stand behind controversial or unique ideas until the majority of the group has expressed their support. So, so they they're risk-averse. They are risk-averse, which leads us to, well, they are survivors. survivors. And right. then there is Two more. This is an interesting one because while they may be enthusiastic, there may be a missing element. And these are called? The yes people, they're enthusiastic, but they lack the critical thinking, or at least they don't exhibit the critical thinking. We love the enthusiasm. We would just like to see some critical thinking and some expression. That and helps. to the degree that they are essentially enabling the ego of a boss, to the degree that that boss is less effective, then they are essentially causing a drag on the effectiveness of the organization. Correct. What we like about them, they are active and committed to the team, that they will defend the leader when faced with the opposition, which is a good trait, but they will not question the decisions or the actions of the leaders. They'll just step along and say, yes, sir. So if we can go back to the Christmas Eve story that General Neller told, if the sergeant had been a yes person, then the sergeant would have taken down the decorations, the general would have felt sorry for himself, and the Marines would have been deprived of an opportunity to share camaraderie on a holiday, and that would have had an effect on unit morale and unit cohesion, and I would then say on unit effectiveness. That's a good point. We would have lost what was a beautiful learning outcome for all of us. That, right. was, a, that was a learning moment. Yeah. It was a learning moment for the leader. For, for the general mm -hmm. himself, right. yes. And for us to watch it, and, and if she had been a yes person, that would not have existed. One of the great learning opportunities in the Marines was right in front of us that wouldn't have happened. And I would venture to guess that he, if he exhibited that behavior uncorrected and that became habitual, he would not have become the Commandant of the Marine Corps. No, that's a good point. Exactly. And then lastly, this is the kind that I hope everybody aspires to be. We call them the all-stars. We call them whatever we may call them. But Talk about them. They, they are, are positive, they're active, they're independent thinkers. We all love guys like that. A few other characteristics. They won't blindly accept the decisions or actions of a leader until they have evaluated those decisions or actions, but they can succeed without the presence of the leader. Yeah, Jack Welch talked a lot about it in his book, Winning. He said, when you have these the people characteristically in that country, get them what they need, get out of their way. If, if I can allow us to be somewhat autobiographical. Many, <laughs> sure. many, many years ago when we were teenagers, uh, each of us managed uh, concession stands at a state park. Yeah, we flipped a lot of hamburgers. We flipped a lot of hamburgers, at, but at some point we each became managers of the facilities we ran. Right. And one of the things that we were taught when we were becoming managers is the quality of the manager. I would, in today's language, say the quality of the leader is how well the operation runs when the manager's not present. Ah, that's a good point. If you can make yourself disappear. How would it be? The mark of the good leader, it's fine without you. The burgers are still being flipped and right. the customers are still being served and, and the facility is still being cleaned. Even though the leader isn't present, isn't it, yeah. the, the all-stars are the ones that step in, but it requires a good leader to, to give those all-stars an environment where they can step in. Well, this is the case of the followership become the leaders when no one's looking. Right. A beautiful thing. Yeah. And then, just to sum that up, what they do is they support the leader when doing the right thing. They stand up and they have the courage to communicate their differences of opinions. How as, valuable as is that? As the sergeant did right. with, the, with the general. Exactly. 
So a couple other things to sum it up with respect to followership. What we know is a few key factors for anyone, whatever kind of follower you aspire to be that will ultimately be a leader, there's three important characteristics to understand. Number one is followership is a proving ground on the path to leadership. You, it is very challenging to become the leader unless you are an ex excellent and impeccable follower. The second is to exhibit leadership qualities to further contributors. And the opportunities for others to notice your potential as a follower and the leadership characteristics that you are able to exhibit, which are best noticed in the upper right-hand quadrant. And then this ties into the Marines, but the seven skills of followership, Fred, maybe we could even, if we wanted to eliminate followership, imagine, would this look any different? And according to Zappos, maybe not. Would it look any different in leadership? So technical competence is on the Marine Corps leadership list. Good judgment is on the Marine Corps leadership list. Honesty is on the list. Transparency as a word isn't, but as a concept it is. Strong work ethic, loyalty, and ego control. I love is, that one. That you is, showed that. That is both self-awareness and self-management. Well, the general was able to put his ego in check when pushed back by the sergeant and able to treat that interaction with respect. What a wonderful moment that was. And again, it's okay to have a moment of failure, but it's not okay to indulge yourself in that moment of failure. And to his credit, he took a deep breath, he looked down and got himself together, and then he acknowledged and apologized and treated the sergeant with respect. Indeed. So the followership benchmark, if we put it any other way, what we ask everybody is one of the call to actions today. One, take direction effectively and with minimal interference. Number two, play well on the team, and that doesn't mean avoid disagreements, but have the disagreements be respectful. And then lastly, delivering more than is expected. It's great to deliver up to expectations, but the really great followers understand the need to every day consistently deliver beyond those expectations. And, and I would venture that those also are critical elements for aspiring leaders, leaders in formation to become even better leaders. For sure. And, and Fred, last couple things left. I want to talk about the what we have found in our leadership practices when we coach the leaders in our world. We have to make an assessment as toward that leadership style. And what we know is sometimes they defy conventions, but what I've done is I put into a line and whenever I do a review on a leader, I do something called a 360 review. And I talk to direct reports, subordinates, managers, and I often want to know, and I draw a continuum and I ask them, what is the leadership style of the individual that we're describing right now? Can you just talk about this continuum? So on the left side of the screen is command and control, and the way that is exhibited is some form of my way or no way. It's essentially the boss who barks orders. And all the way on the right side is collaborate and connect. It's the person who uh, only makes judgments after consulting with and getting input from the team and from others. And, and the way that manifests itself is problem facilitation and building consensus in solving the problems that they are in the process of uh, attempting to facilitate. And often what we do in the leadership styles, we seek to determine where that leader may fit in the continuum in general. This is just a very broad stroke so that we can understand that leadership style. And what was surprising, Fred, in the Marines, I expected command and control when in fact what we got was a collaboration connect. And sometimes when you expect collaboration connect, some of the leaders have to, sometimes out of necessity, well, have certainly to give command. when correcting a, a, a failure, there's a need to say, this is how you got to do it. But that is in response to a stimulus, not necessarily as an ongoing style. Indeed, and what we know is whether you are leading or whether you are following. I'm a mountaineer, if you haven't seen from those pictures. When I lead someone up a mountain, I also follow someone up a mountain, and they exhibit what we're talking about is be the great follower because that is the path up to your mountain summit to be the great leader. 
What we're talking about here, leaders, followership, and what you speak often about in your books is organizational alignment. Are we moving together toward a cause? And that the, the ability to have that vision, what is the destination, what is the summit we are trying to get to, and how do we move with our people in that direction and get closer and closer to that achievement is one of the core disciplines of any leader using all of the temperaments that we've just described. And what I described as a mountaineer in the law that we live by, but we saw it in our corporate world and the marine world, is something called the law of reciprocity. If you want to succeed, one of the best, best paths to that success is give somebody more than you've gotten and they will in turn give you more than they have received and together you will look out for each other as you climb that's your career a, summits. That's a great law. Yeah, I love that law. And lastly, let's finish up with your friend. My friend Aristotle. Aristotle, and he said, he who cannot be a good follower cannot be a good leader. And Our, if Aristotle said it, it must be true. Well, let's go to the <laughs> Aristotle of the modern world. His name is Tom Peters that we all grew up in our generation reading. And while he published a book called In Search, in Search of, of Excellence, Excellence, I was still in college. I never forgot about the impact he had it had on me and all of the literature that he's wrote about. That was the first business book I ever had. Uh, it was one of my <laughs> first. And this is what he said. Fred, share he with said, us leaders the don't create more followers. They create more leaders. Is there even a difference. And Tom Peters suggests no, and he talks a lot about a concept called servant leadership, that the leader serves the follower. The general served the sergeant, but what did the sergeant do? The sergeant was actually looking after her Marines for sure, and holding the general accountable to protect her Marines. And in case you want to learn more about all the books that are in Amazon.com, all 237 of them, we want to leave you with a few call to actions. One, as you heard from this, is the importance of understanding and having the growth mindset. Sometimes you are the follower. It is the path to leader. Sometimes as a leader, you will become the follower. You can read more about them in some of these books. And Fred, let's bring that home. Your conclusion, Marine, civilian, what is the takeaway in their call to action? One of my calls to action here is the importance of intentionality in all of this. That we don't become good followers or good leaders by accident. We do it intentionally because we discern what is significant to us in our careers and in the work that we do. And then we organize ourselves with others in order to best achieve that purpose. And if we are working towards a purpose, we can far better align the things we talked about. We will be good followers, we will be good leaders, we will pivot easily between the leadership and followership role, but mostly because we'll be on the right side, upper right of the quadrant, that we will be critical thinkers and we will be active and we will help move the organization without having to be supervised directly. And it is that self-motivation and that self-discipline and that self-regulation that allows us to constantly improve as followers and as leaders. So thank you for your time. This is the setup, as we talked about at the introduction, to the three pillars of this particular class, leadership, followership, and teamwork. What we hope is we've given you a guide and the opportunity to develop a mindset about is there in fact a difference? How do you behave in that organization that becomes from a follower to a leader? And then we're gonna hand the baton and you're gonna learn about teamwork. How do you put all of that in place so that the lines may be blurred or they may be cleared, but you'll understand the importance of bringing both the leadership and the followership mindset, in fact, if even there's something different, into the teamwork environment. Fred, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chuck, and we'll see you in the classroom in other parts of the Professional Development and Leadership Program at Columbia Engineering. Thank you.